الحمد لله الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has brought us to the end of this year and as we close out the year we look forward to another year inshallah in this regard most people think of New Year's resolution which in of itself is a good thing except we as Muslims should have daily resolutions instead of a yearly resolution we are in sync with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his rahmah, with his fadl with his grace and this is a daily occurrence where the Prophet وسلم, advised us through his daily du'as that we need to renew our sense of service to Allah, our sense of ibadah to Allah. Prophet وسلم, would say every morning, Asbahna wa asbalh wa asbah al mulk lillahi rabbil alameen. And in the evening, he will say, Amsayna wa amsal mulk lillahi rabbil alameen. We have come into the morning, and the kingdom still belongs to Allah. We have come into the evening, and the kingdom still belongs to Allah. This is the awareness of a Nabi, that the Nabi is always in sync with Allah and with whatever Allah is doing. And Allah creates all the time. There is not a moment in the existence of creation when Allah is not creating. So the Prophet ﷺ taught the Sahaba the civilizational adab, ethics, behavior that we owe Allah. In the morning, the Prophet ﷺ said, it is wajib on the human being, necessary on the human being to thank Allah for every limb and bone that is intact after we wake up in the morning. We should give sadaqah for every limb and organ every morning. The Sahaba asked, Ya Rasulullah, how do we do that? We're not rich enough. So the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes a reformation of their understanding of richness and their understanding of wealth. As the Prophet explains to the Sahaba reality, he always engaged in reforming the ideas and ideals of people as he instructed people how to do prayer. He also instructed them how to think and how to see the world and how to see Allah. So he said, you don't need money to thank Allah. That's in your mind, which is in the minds of everybody who lives in the USA and even who's a capitalist and you live in capitalism. You're going to think, oh, I need money to be rich. I need money to give charity. The Prophet of Islam abolished that thought, uprooted the idea that you need money in order to be wealthy. And you need money in order to give charity. He's a Muslim. He's a reformer. Not reforming only action, but reforming the way people think. That is called being Rasulullah. He's not an ordinary man. He's not simply a genius. He is Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah. He represents Allah. So he tells them 
All of you can afford to pay 360 amounts of money. It's very simple. But before you do that, abolish the idea from your mind that wealth is about being materially wealthy, having a huge bank account, having properties, luxurious cars, and having a good time. In Islam, in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ raised a community that believed in Allah and not in money. Even if you have money, he said you have to still believe in Allah. Qarun, who was from the people of Musa, alayhi salam, was so rich that it went beyond filthy rich. All the rich people in this dunya today, they have nothing compared to what Qarun had. The treasures to his vaults, the treasures to Qarun's vaults had keys. Those keys, Allah says, that very strong people could barely carry the, tree, the keys to his treasures. Never mind the treasure of the vault. And here we are in the US of A, assuming that we have a healthy bank account, alhamdulillah, we're rich. But you know what Allah did to Qarun and his wealth? Because he didn't believe in Allah, he didn't believe in Musa. He destroyed him. The earth gulped him up, swallowed him. Not only him, but his dwellings also. Because he was mischievous. He was not in sync with Allah. He was not in sync with the idea that kingdom belongs to Allah, not to me and not to wealth. In Islam, we have a high priority. Much higher priority than wealth, material wealth. So the Prophet said, first of all, remove this misconception. Reform your worldview and don't assume for a moment that it is wealth that's going to give you success. Then he said, saying one subhanallah will fulfill the requirement of one limb. All of you can afford to say subhanallah 360 times. It is easy, it is free. You don't have to pay for it. You don't need to store it in a bank. You don't need security for this wealth. And the Sahaba followed. SubhanAllah, this is so simple. So the Prophet made it easy for the Sahaba to be rich without money, which is just mind boggling. Mind boggling. That they, that they had a community where you had two or three individuals who were fairly rich, mashallah, very rich. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Uthman radiallahu anhu, very rich. But the majority of Sahaba were okay. They made ends meet. So when the Prophet of Islam said that when you're in sync with Allah and His kingdom, you wake up in the morning and you announce through your dua that we have entered the morning as the kingdom of creation belongs to Allah. Acknowledging the macro with the micro. Acknowledging that our wealth 
and our security lies in our connection with Allah, the Almighty, who is the creator of all. And then they gave their sadaqah every morning. They would say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. They would recite these duas and these adhkar formally for daily success as a ritual. So it wasn't just mere rote dhikr that sometimes many people now, especially here in the US, they dismiss the idea of dhikr. What's the point of dhikr? What's one subhanallah going to do for me? Well, my dear brother, that subhanallah may just save you from the fire of hell, which no power on earth can do. Now your wealth is not coming with you into your grave. There ain't no democracy there. There's no Republican, there's no Democratic Party there to save you. There's no citizenship that can save you from what might happen in your grave. But the Prophet ﷺ gave us a formula that will save us. Being hygienic. It's a formula. Muslims are supposed to be hygienic all the time. So the Prophet ﷺ said that if you, if you protect yourself from urine, you know, in this culture, there's no concept of that kind of hygiene. It doesn't exist. Period. Unfortunately, Muslims have now jumped onto the bandwagon and they don't assume that taking care of their urine is actually Islamic. It has a value, but this value transcends this world. It's not limited to this world. He said, Be careful with your urine. Stay away from it because most of the punishment of the grave is because of this negligence. There we are. What do we teach our children? Mashallah, we go everywhere. Bathrooms are there everywhere. How much do we abstain from allowing the urine to splash on us? And how much do we do cleaning afterwards? So being in sync with Allah is what the Prophet ﷺ came to give us. The Prophet ﷺ also said, if you read Surah Al-Mulk, this is the beginning of the Akhirah. Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Tabarak al bi yadihi al-Mulk, that Surah, if you recite that Surah every day, that Surah will protect you from any potential punishment in the grave. And now we have people saying, what's the point of reading the Quran? It's just the Quran. That's what happens when you're short-sighted. You only think of this dunya, there's nothing after. Our Iman forces us to believe that there's another life after we die. If you don't believe that, you're not a Muslim. Period. We are Muslim because we have a formula for salvation, which is after we die after we resurrected from the graves, after we appear in front of Allah, and after the hisab, God forbid, is done, then we go into Jannah. That's salvation. This is premised on the aqidah that there is life after death. That is the meaning of asbaha al The kingdom, total sovereignty, dominion, Power, absolute authority lies in the hands of Allah. What does this do? It makes us human. Animals don't care for their urine. Animals don't care how they do whatever they do. We all know that. Human beings are supposed to be dignified, sophisticated, understand what is the ruling of creation. If there is filth, you take care of it. You don't endorse it. You don't celebrate it. 
So whether it's dog poo or human poo, it doesn't matter. You have to take care of it. That is what a human being does. Animals, they can care less. They're not made for that. That's why we call them animals. They're distinct from human beings. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ renewed his resolution every day. Not once a year, which none of us fulfill our resolutions anyway. We all know that. It's just one big scam. It's a psychological scam. They'll have a resolution, and then one week later, back to normal. But with the awareness of a Nabi, the conscience of a Nabi, the ma'rifah, the understanding of Allah that a Nabi brings to the human being makes the human being a human being. That is the first value of Islam. And don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. Our young children and our younger generation seem to think that Islam is outdated, antiquated, it is obsolete, it has no relevance. Which, if you are short-sighted, and you don't see hope after you die, then yes. Maybe for you it is irrelevant. Maybe it is obsolete. Maybe you won't benefit from it. But then you must ask yourself, which civilization on the planet, which religion on the planet teaches you how not to just survive death and to beat it, but live after you die? There ain't any genius on the planet who can think of this. No one. Whoever your heroes are, your sports, sports athletes, your music celebrities, your actors, your actresses, whoever they may be in your mind, your hero, your business giants, the ideologies that you think makes the world work, none of those will teach you how to be successful after you die. There ain't any insurance policy against death. So before, before you ride your high horse and you assume you know everything there is to know, then for once, listen to the Prophet. Why? Because he is Rasulullah. He represents Allah whose kingdom is the kingdom in which we live. Atheists will say what they want. Agnostics may say what they want. The so-called free-thinking Muslim may say what he or she wants. But the ultimate reality that every human being knows and perhaps should acknowledge is that death is imminent. Death is inevitable. And the Prophet ﷺ usually in his Friday khutbahs, would speak of death. To remind the Sahaba, you're going to die. And if you don't prepare for death, no one and nothing can help you. So he was always concerned for the well-being of a believer. This is called compassion. You're concerned what's going to happen to you, are you going to get sick? Are you going to fail your exam? You won't have a good life if you don't do this, if you do this. That's concern, that's compassion, that's affection, which is normal and natural. But no one, no one is more affectionate than the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa No one. No one in history can be as affectionate, compassionate as our Rasul. You must see him as your leader. Not all of these Mickey Mouse theories that has done nothing but corrupt the world. The proof is in the pudding. No one's happy in this country. No one's happy in the world. 
They're looking for something which doesn't exist in the place they're looking for. This is a wake-up call for me and for you. The Rasulullah sallam, was always in sync with Allah and his authority and his kingdom. That is compassion. Why? Because you're concerned about what's going to happen to human beings after they die. That's the role only a Nabi can fulfill. Because only the Nabi knows what's going to happen to us after we die. We make dua. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to see the Rasul as a Rasul. Allows us to see Rasulullah as a Rasulullah. Allows us to benefit from his words. And allows us to make the best resolution that there can be. And that is to make tawbah. And ask Allah for his forgiveness. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen.